beautiful. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here with me today because I have another question for you. As a midwife, I've asked so many women this question, so I now am about to ask you this question. What is one of the biggest, most common fears that women have about giving birth? Ooh, you should put it in the comments. Yeah. If you said the fear of tearing while pushing your baby out, you're right. Most of the time that comes up in the top one to three biggest fears. And so this whole apothecary wisdom episode is all about helping you have a realistic expectation for your postpartum recovery so that you can learn more about how to take care of vaginal tears, postpartum tears, and I will share with you all my midwife tips and herbal remedies with herb baths and with yoni steams and with pad sickles so that you don't have to suffer too much. My name is Maria Chaudhry and I'm a licensed midwife and uh, an herbalist and the creator of Birth Song Botanicals. And we make nourishing herbal remedies for all sorts of phases in a woman's life. And the primarily today I want to focus on our herbal remedies for postpartum recovery. You can find out more about us on birthsongbotanicals.com. And this is a live event, right? So today we're going to be talking about perineal tears. So in the comments, I'd like to see how many of you that are listening are pregnant and if you are pregnant, when are you going to give birth? And if you are pregnant and watching this, I'm so glad you're here. This is the right time. You're at the right place at the right time. How many of you are postpartum? And if so, when did you give birth? When was your baby born? And really the other big question is, if, have you ever had a tear? And what did you do about your tear? So even though this is live, I'm in the front of the camera and Heaven's behind the camera. She's working her magic, making sure Instagram's going and making sure Facebook's going and moderating everything. Okay, so I'm just going to just start to roll with this and just go get in deep into it because we've got a lot of material to cover today and I'm actually pretty excited about this topic because vaginal tears and perineal tears are in one way are a really big deal and they can seem really overwhelming and in another way your body is amazing and can recover really quickly and I want to just highlight all that with you and the other reason why I'm really excited about this video in particular is because I know how hundreds of thousands and millions of women in the United States give birth and then they go home and then they're alone and they're there alone, maybe they have their family and their support system, but they don't have a care provider with them. And then six weeks later, after it's all processed and all healed up, then they go back to the doctor. And so they're not having appropriate and adequate postpartum care. And the big reason why I'm making this video, even though I'm not attending births, I still want you to have adequate care. It's essential. Being a postpartum woman, a postpartum mom is so vulnerable in almost every facet of your life, in every part of your personality, your identity, your body, your spirituality, your emotions, and you need help and support in any way you can get it as long as it's in alignment and helping you actually get better. So that's what this video is all about. This video was stemmed from that need to help you because you're not getting adequate care. And this video is also stemmed from a conversation I had with a client. And that's what sparked me to write this original blog post when um, she shared with me, we had a, a postpartum visit and she's like, oh my gosh, my girlfriend was talking, we were hanging out talking and my girlfriend was like, okay, now you've had a couple of kids and she was wanting, her girlfriend was wanting to get pregnant and learn about it. And Girlfriend was like, so what's the biggest changes in your body? And then my client is a very um, honest, clear-spoken, 
powerful, beautiful woman. And she was like, well, do you really want to know? She's like, yeah, the other girl's like lingering on her every word. Like, yeah, what, what, what? She's like, okay, so I used to have this really just sweet little yoni. And now I've got a crotch. And my crotch needs a lot of attention. And the other girl was like, and then, and then when she told me that, it was hilarious because she was animated and expressing her self and then her friend's self and how her friend's face went really white and uh, felt really afraid and was starting to question if she really wanted kids. And so that's what sparked this whole conversation of like, let's write about that. Let's explore. Since this is one of the biggest fears that women have, let's go there. What happens if you tear? What does it feel like? What does your vagina feel like? What does your rectum feel like? Do you know how to take care of stitches? How long is it gonna to take to recover? What, you know, what are the stages of healing? All those are important questions, so let's break them down. Also, I wanna just say, before we get too deep into this, I want to describe perineal tears, and I want to talk about the best thing we can do about them is to try to prevent them in the first place. And I think I'm gonna make a much longer video about this when I start my childbirth class series, but here are some bullet point lists. If you wanna prevent perineal tears and you're pregnant, hydration is your key. Hydration and nourishment, because perineal tears and skin elasticity and ability to open and flex versus being rigid comes from hydration, adequate vitamins and minerals, and a fats and protein. You need to have a lot of protein. If you're deficient in protein and B vitamins, your skin is very friable and you're prone to stretch marks and prone to tears. Women that are prone to stretch marks are more prone to tears. It's a deep collagen tissue. So some of you are like, oh, shit, I got stretch marks already. I'm not even pregnant, right? So that, hydration and nutrition. The other one is pelvic floor tone and integrity. What I mean by that is walking, walking every day while you're pregnant especially, and squatting. Even if you're not squatting outside to use the restroom like our foremothers did, you're, out, you're squatting every day. You're either in a yoga class squatting or you're squatting to pick up stuff. Ina Mae Gaskin, famous midwife, she's like, if you squat 200 times a day, which is excessive, but if you did that, your birth would be smooth and easy and you'll have a perineum like no other. So you wanna like breeze through this whole pregnancy thing, squat. The other primary reason and way to prevent perineal tearing is maintaining your baby in an optimal fetal position. This is gonna absolutely be a whole other video. But essentially what I'm trying to say is you need your baby to have the back near the front so the head is flat and you're getting all your kicks way over on the left side or all the baby's kicks way over on the right side. If you're getting all the baby's kicks in the front, you have a posterior baby. That's a much harder birth and you're more likely to tear. So if you want your baby to be in an optimal position, you're gonna walk and squat like it's going out of style, and you're going to do a bunch of pelvic rocks, and you'll keep your baby in an optimal position. Do not assume just because you're feeling the baby move and the head is down that the baby's in a good position. That's inaccurate information. You need the baby's back to be in the front, okay? The next thing that helps prevent perineal tears, which studies go a little either way, is self Perineal massage. Self-perineal massage when you're pregnant as a prenatal preparation for birth is not a pleasant massage. It's not like this, oh, feel good relaxation situation. It is a massage that intentionally creates a lot of pressure on your perineum. And then when you stretch your, if you're doing it yourself, you'll use your thumbs. And when you stretch your thumbs out across your perineum, you're stretching it and you are relaxing with your breath and softening all around the intensity of that pressure and that stretch and you're training yourself to relax with that sensation 
and that will help you when you're pushing your baby out instead of trying to just push through it you soften and allow the baby to be born that's going to really retain the integrity of your pelvic floor so there's that included in that conversation there is perineal massage during labor which may or may not be helpful it's helpful for a person who has an epidural to teach them where to push however i will say this vigorous perineal massage in labor actually traumatizes your tissues and if you did not have an epidural there is no way you would ever stand to have a person touch you like that and um it's not recommended unless there is an urgent need to get the baby out. The other thing that can help prevent perineal tearing is perineal support. Perineal support can be that you do it yourself or your care provider does it for you. If you're going to perineal support yourself, it's pretty simple in theory. Essentially, when the baby's coming out and being born, and you feel your tissues burn and stretch, you put your hand right where it's burning and stretching, and then you're supporting your perineum. Just put your hands right where it's burning and stretching. Along with that comes a whole bunch of other things that are all related. The When you feel the baby being born and your tissues stretching, that's called the ring of fire. That is the most intense moment of your entire life. I am not joking, right? You're, you need to psychologically, physically, mentally prepare for those moments. They're going to be brief, but they are whoo, big, right? So if you're going to support yourself, you're going to put your hands down there. If you're going to have your care provider do it, your midwife do it, or your doctor, they're just going to place, they're not pushing, they're not resisting anything. They're holding and supporting your perineum down on the bottom. And they're holding and supporting the top up near your urethra and near your clitoris. If you're going to tear anywhere, you want to tear on the bottom. That's so much easier to repair and recover. This upstairs, up here, perineum, I'm sorry, excuse me, urethra, clitoris, labia, that's all hard to repair. So when you're going to protect somewhere, protect up top so that it, that you're most, most likely you're not going to tear there. But if you do tear there, that's a much more, you need, you need fine, smaller needles and it's more important to protect. Down here on the bottom, it's open, it's easier to repair, it's made to give birth. Okay. In this same moment, I know I'm lingering in this intense moment because it feels like it takes forever. You, the woman that's giving birth, you have inside of you this like immense pressure that is trying to come out, right? At the same time, if you just bear down and push with all your might at that time, you're more than likely just going to add extra pressure. Your body doesn't need extra pressure unless there's a, an obstetrical emergency, but most of the time the baby's just gonna come right out. I'm saying all that to say, when you feel it burn, you blow out the flame. It goes like this. So it's burning. So instead of bearing down, don't do that. Instead you go. It makes all your energy come up here a little bit. So that down here you can relax and your body can do it. It kind of gets you out of the way. And so you blow out the fire. And then the baby's born, right? Woo, baby's born. What else? Oh, another key factor to preventing perineal tears is two more things. Body-led pushing versus being told what to do. So a woman who is having a natural birth, whether at home, in a birth center, in a hospital, in a pool of water, she's unmedicated, she will feel the sensations in her body, and when it's time to push, there'll be a lot of pressure on the pelvic floor, and it's just like an urgency to have a bowel movement. It's a real similar thing. The vast majority of the sensations of pushing is in your rectum, 
Most of the time, it's just all rectum. Rectum pressure, pressure, rectum pressure, 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 pressure in your rectum until it starts to burn on the outside. When it starts to burn on the outside, it's almost the only time you ever feel it in the vaginal area. And then that's the peak spot, and then the baby's born. So when you're not medicated, when you work with your body, you've been preparing for this for so long. You've been working with your breath. So when you feel that pressure to push, you work with your body, and then when the pressure goes away, you rest. You push just enough to facilitate it, but you're not pushing too much to hurt yourself, right? Because you're cognizant, you're aware, you're body-led. The sensations are coming from inside your body versus being numb and having an epidural and being in a room full of other people on the outside of you telling you what you need to do right now because they can they have their hand on your abdomen or they're looking at the monitor and they can see oh there's a contraction and so they start to yell at you to say push and then you count push one two three four five six seven eight nine ten take a deep breath do it again one two three four five six seven eight nine ten one more one more you got it come on one two three four five six seven eight nine ten okay okay good okay now you can rest right all that is coming from outside of you you cannot feel what's happening and you're getting so much stimulation and you want to be over you do not even if you're numb you know you don't want to linger in this situation you want to be done and so you just push with everything you've got at the same time you've got another person giving you helping you with perineal vigorous massage to help get the baby out right so that is traumatizing to your tissues does that make sense okay we're on the same page the next way you can help protect your precious little perineum area is choosing a birth position that facilitates biological birth. If you're choosing, or if for whatever reason you're having an epidural and you're flat on your back and you're in the lithotomy position with your feet up in the stirrups, your chances of tearing are much higher a, because I just all that outside, but also B, because of the way your pelvis is shaped, that the baby is, you're having to push uphill. And since gravity never ceases, we want to utilize gravity and utilize our body and be in such an open position so that the baby can be born with the least amount of effort. The best ways to prevent tearing will be like when you lay on your side or when you're just instinctive, whatever way your body wants to do it. Like you're, you're on your hands and knees and then all of a sudden you shift over a little bit and you lift your right leg or you lift your left leg or you just hunch over or you do a tiny little pelvic rock or you kind of come up to a squat. All that stuff was instinctual and that helps open up your pelvis in a way so that the baby can navigate. You and your baby are being a team and so I'm going to definitely make a video about birthing positions because being upright in a squat, in some ways squatting can be really hard in your perineum because there's just a lot of um, expulsion pressure and it shortens your birth canal and the baby can come out faster in one way that's great and another way people um, can tear more with that. But side lying, being on your hands and knees, being in the water, the classic position where you where you're giving your own perineal support or standing those are all great positions to utilize uh, gravity and to open up your pelvis so if you can be in one of those wise positions that your chances of tearing are a lot less okay questions thoughts comments we have a comment okay somebody said i am really enjoying this information thank you for this hopefully one day i can put it to use fingers crossed emoji Woohoo! remember this like watch this video again <laughs> right before you give birth well uh, weeks before you give birth so you can prepare yourself okay where am i at uh, let's talk more about tears okay so there are types of tears okay you've got degrees of tears so let's talk about degrees of tears you have first degree tear second degree tear third degree tear fourth degree tear 
The vast majority of tears are going to be down on your perineum. This is your vaginal canal. This is, like I said, your urethra clitoris, and then your labia and your perineum. If the tear just goes through the skin and just into the muscle, that's a first degree tear. If it goes through into the skin, through the muscle, that's a second degree tear. If it goes into the skin, through the muscle, and deeper into the pelvic floor, that's a third degree tear. And then if it goes all the way into the pelvic floor and you can start to see the rectum or through the rectum, that's a fourth degree tear. Third and fourth degree tears need to be sutured by someone that is a savvy suture. OBs are excellent at this. They suture all day, every day. Home birth midwives, we transport for that. We get somebody else that has a higher level of skill to suture those tears. Now, if you have a first degree or a second degree tear, they can be sutured at home. Let's talk a little bit more. Type, I'm going to go back to kind of types of tearing and where you're most likely to tear. I don't know if you can see my hand, but look at your own hand. Make your fingers like this and look at your own hand. So, the most common place to tear is down at your perineum, like at 6 o'clock or maybe a little off like at um, 5 or 7, right? Also, when you look at my hand, you see there are little lines in my hand and they, they're opposite each other. These are places that you tear too. They're like little skid marks. So this, this is a fold in your vaginal canal and the baby passed through it and it just got stretched out and it was a skid mark. So skid marks are just superficial tears on the surface. And these tears are like right where my knuckles are and across from each other. That's a real common place to have a skid mark, right? To have this little superficial abrasion and then down here is your most common place. Okay, let's talk a little bit more. Why would you get stitches? Here was my protocol and this is how I talk to my clients so they could be prepared so they weren't on the spot to make a decision. After the birth process, after the placenta was out, before her herb bath, before she got too deeply settled in, or just at the appropriate time, it was time for me to examine and to look at her perineum to see what we needed to do. Okay? So what I would do is I would explain this whole process, and I essentially like this. I'll do it. Okay, so I want to check you for tears. So in your own time, let me tell you what I'm going to do, and in your own time, we're going to do this. I'm going to have these two 4x4 gauze pads and I'm going to put them in very cold KY jelly, right? I'm going to very, when you say I can, when you say ready, I will gently open up your labia. I'm going to look at the top. I'm going to look at your clitoris and your urethra. I'm going to gently open up the folds of your vagina and I'm going to look and see. And then I'm going to put my finger in and I'm going to feel your pelvic floor, okay? And so when you say when, that's when I'm going to do that, right? You might have to practice your breathing with this. You might have to go back to your coping breathing because this might burn, but I need to get a full picture of what's happening so we can make a good decision. Okay? That's something I would say something like that. So before I even touch her, I would have her on a chucks pad and then have her lay her legs open. So like you're laying on your back and you just are like doing the butterfly stretch and open up your legs as far as you can. Just a natural opening. Just by observation, if I look and see, if I look and see that there is a tear and that it is opened up, like the two sides, one side and one side are not touching, they're opened up, then, and it doesn't seem too deep, then I would say, well, if it seems too deep and it's through the muscle and I'm seeing that this is a deep tear, then I'll, I have to break the news that while this is a pretty intense tear, we're going to probably need to get it evaluated and get it stitched at the hospital. If it's not too deep of a tear but the sides are still open, 
then I would say something like, okay, so this is not too deep of a tear. This is something I can manage at home. But you see how you're spread open? And I'll show it with a mirror. And she's like, I want you to see this. If, if she wants to. Most people kind of want to see. Not everybody does. But just find your own comfort. But do, do you see how these are open? If these two sides are open, then stitches will hold these two sides together. The other scenario is I have her open. And I look, and if it looks like there's a tear, but they're holding together on their own, even with her legs spread and they're holding together on their own, then even if there's a tear and it's not too deep, but it's holding together, then I say, I don't really think you need stitches. I think you're, you can be totally appropriate to allow your body to heal naturally. Let's make sure you get a bunch of herb baths. Let's make sure you get some kombu and get your peri bottle all set up and take good care of yourself, but I don't think you need stitches. So the bottom line for me is open, stitches, closed, natural. Make sense? I want to say one other thing. Stitches, uh, I want to say two more things. Stitches in and of themselves have risk and benefits, right? They have a, a good aspect and a, on sometimes a little bit of a challenging aspect. All stitches do is they take this side and this side and hold it together. That's all they're doing. Your body's own innate natural ability to heal itself will do all the work. Meaning this side and this side, circulation will create new cells and it'll just close up and heal. The downside to stitches that you need to be aware of when you're making decisions and when you're talking with your care provider to get her perspective or their perspective on this is when you inject the lidocaine and then when you make the stitches, each one of those are puncture wounds. Each one of those are ways that you're can adding to the trauma of the tissues, right? So it's holding your tissues together, which is really good. At the same time, you're creating a bunch of new wounds. So if you only have to put two little stitches in, is it really worth the extra trauma? And gaping open in the moment has to really be, you know, when you're with your care provider, you have to think this kind of stuff through. Hopefully you have these conversations before you push your baby out so you're not laying on the couch or on the bed, wherever you're getting examined and being in the situation and having to make a decision on the spot. Okay? So that's just in a nutshell about tears. Oh, one other thing. There was one other thing. The tears, these superficial little tears that do not need stitches, right? The problem with those tears versus the tear into the muscle is the tear into the muscle, your body doesn't have these, it has nerves, but it doesn't have the pain, same pain nerves deep in there. So a deep into the muscle, belly of the muscle, sometimes doesn't hurt as bad as this little superficial tear on the wall of your vagina. It's just because, think of it, your, your vaginal area has tons of nerve tissue. I mean, that's why sex feels good, right? You have all this like sensation and it feels good, but now it's just been stretched. It's almost like a paper cut hurts so bad, right? It's been stretched and there's so many tissues on the sur or so many nerve cells on the surface that that area really stings and burns. So it usually doesn't last long, but it tends to be the thing that people comment on. It's like, ooh, that, that really is kind of my most unpleasant thing. So it's just because it's superficial. Superficial sounds, <laughs> sounds deep. Okay, let's go further. All right. Essentially, with this whole conversation, we talked about what tears are, how to prevent them, and like parameters or guidelines to see if stitches are appropriate. Now let's talk about like postpartum expectations and experiences. Immediately after the birth, most of the time women might feel a little burning if she has a tear. And she might feel just like heavy and other some she'll have all these other things going on too like she'll have uterine cramps and some bleeding 
right? That all happens immediately, and I'll make a whole different video all about like other postpartum symptoms so you can like be really prepared for that. But in terms of the perineum, oftentimes immediately it's the burning, and a lot of times they don't feel too much pain right away. They feel more this overarching hormonal <sighs> relief and feel better than they did a few moments ago, right? They just feel a lot better. And so the pain and the discomfort of perineal tears actually tends to show up in the first three days postpartum than more so than immediately. We change more hormonally the first three days postpartum, the first 72 hours postpartum, than we do during our entire pregnancy. We're doing that because we had the placenta full of estrogen and progesterone that has now left our body, and now we need to create breast milk. And so we're having lactin, uh, lactogen and prolactin, and they are taking over. And so we, and that's happening in the first 72 hours, and that's going to be when you start to feel the most intense. The hardest days postpartum that you experience are days three through five. Your first day, you're like, woo, I pushed a baby out. Mm, I can, I'm amazing. I mean, did you know, do you know how amazing I am? I mean, look at this baby. Oh my gosh, I feel great. Right? I can do it. And then the next day, you're like, oh yeah, I'm a little tired. And the third day, you're like, oh, I'm crying. I hurt. Right? I'm tired. Overwhelmed. And then day five, it gets worse, you know, and then eventually, it's not always exactly the same, but eventually people start to feel a little bit better. So just anticipate and expect day three to five to be your hardest days, and they're gonna feel, your perineum's gonna feel the most tender. So what are we gonna do about that? What are some things? We are going to get you in some herb baths. Okay, I've got some supplies here, and I want you to be prepared for all this stuff before you give birth, and I'm going to talk about them. So on the blog that's linked underneath this video, I have this list and of these supplies that are specific for your perineal care. Okay, the first thing you have in your supplies, I'll get to the herb bath in just a second. The first thing is just a bunch of supplies are these, these are mesh panties. You, they're disposable, one size fits all. You want a couple pair of these or you wanna get some big comfortable cotton underwear that you don't care about bleeding, they're not tight fitting. They're, they're fitting enough that they can hold a pad up but they're not, they're not fancy, they're not cute and they're not tight, right? So you need a bunch of these. And then you're going to need your peri bottle. So let's talk about your peri bottle. There's so much to say. This peri bottle is going, you're gonna fill it up with warm water, either fresh warm water from the sink. And when you go to the restroom, when you pee, you're gonna squeeze this water on you as you pee. You're gonna, when you spray it on you as you pee, it's going to dilute your urine so it doesn't sting so bad, especially on those superficial tears. And you're gonna spray it right down on your tear, right? It'll help you, you get a little more, it'll help you clean up so you have good clean hygiene. And then when you have a bowel movement, you're gonna clean up and then you can pat dry. Don't wipe, but just pat dry. You're not ready for wiping. Perry bottle, let's talk about some other things. Definitely pure clean water. However, I have a couple of things that you're just going to have to use your imagination. Once you make your herb bath, which I'm about to go into, you can, you'll have this pot of herb bath. You can either use some of this herb bath and put it into your, into your bottle. You can fill it up and then add water. Or after you're like, oh shoot, you poured all your herb bath into the bathtub, and you're like, oh shoot, I wanted to fill my prayer bottle. Just get some of the water from the bathtub that's clean into your peri bottle and utilize this because then you have the herbal application and the warmth to apply like an herbal infusion and tea 
on your perineum and on your stitches. And so you can always have extra herb bath for your peri bottle. That's a great extra way to just facilitate healing really rapidly. If you run out of herb bath, another product of ours that you can use is core care powder. This is an older bottle. When you get it, it's gonna look like this, but I'm just gonna demonstrate with you. So to make this, all you're gonna do is have, imagine this is a cup of hot water, like you make boiled water, pour, pour boiling water in there, and then get about a half a teaspoon of herbs, and then pour it into your boiling water, and then pour your nice new herbal cord care powder infusion into your peri bottle. There will be powder in there. That's okay, don't worry. The, the powder is herbs and they're antiseptic and they're just gonna be good. It's not gonna bother, it shouldn't be a problem or a bother. The benefit of the cord care powder into your bottle, why you would wanna do that as opposed to just water, is these herbs are highly antiseptic. And one of the biggest concerns people have is hygiene and infection and pain. And so if you wanna help prevent that, you wanna keep it as clean as possible, and just think of these herbs as antiseptic, first aid. If you have any, they can be applied to any sort of wound or broken, torn, stitched area. So core care powder in your peri bottle, rinsing at every urination and every bowel movement. So each bathroom should have a little perineum station. Each bathroom's at the back of the toilet's got a basket. It's got a peri bottle. It's got your pads. And then, you know, if you even want your, I didn't put this on the list. I should, um, witch hazel tux pads. You can put those on your list too and have those in the bathroom. Okay. What else? So the next thing, the next thing you get and you need to have a lot of are Chuck's pads. And essentially this is for when you're recovering, whether you have stitches or not, or you have a tear or not. When you're recovering, sometimes you need to, like, just let it air out, right? You don't always need, you've got your postpartum bleeding, you've got a pad on, right? And then there's just so much just wetness and sensation and irritation, right? But yet you don't want to just be, you want to protect your sheets and protect your bed and protect yourself. So you just need some chuck pads so you can just lay down on your chuck pads and just allow your body to air out. So that's what these chuck pads are for. The other thing you're going to need is a bunch of pads. And you're going to need, just because you're going to be bleeding a lot, and then the other thing you're going to want and need are your herb baths and your peri cold packs. I'm going to show you these peri cold packs real quick. These peri cold packs, you can get them in your birth kit if you have a home birth or you can get them at the hospital. The thing about these are you when you open it, don't take it out of the package and then open it. Keep it in the package because you have to use a lot of muscle to like pop it. And when you pop it open, you'll feel that this thing gets cool, right? And this coolness is gonna feel really good on your stitches because your, your, or your perineum is gonna feel hot and bruised and swollen and inflamed. The problem with this cold pack is, it's primarily this liquid coldness and there's only a very thin layer to absorb. So when you look at it and you're gonna see all this blood on top of it, it's not an accurate evaluation of blood loss and it's going to appear as if you're bleeding quite a bit because it's going to be very saturated and it's not going to absorb very much so the chances of blood running down your leg is probably with one of these. However, I'm going to show you how to make an herbal one in just a second. Okay, so let's do the herb baths and I can show you how to make the herbal peri cold pack. Okay, so postpartum herb bath. is to me honestly 
This is what I thought would be the best seller of all our Bursong Botanicals products. It is our second or third best seller. Our best seller, it's our second best seller. Our best seller by far is Let There Be Milk. Um, but I thought it was gonna be this. I'm gonna talk to you about postpartum herb baths and how I learned about them and know about them and why I believe in them so much. Not just to like tell you my stuff, but like from real experience. When I was training to be a midwife, you know, you're an apprentice, you don't make any money, right? You have to hustle to try to get by. So I thought, oh, I'll train to be a doula. And if I train to be a doula, it's going to be a win-win situation. I'll learn about going to hospitals. I'll be able to communicate. I'll learn about the hospital policy. I'll learn about what's going on in hospital births. And I'll make a little bit of money. Okay. I think learning this about the postpartum herb baths is the best thing about that whole idea of becoming a doula. A little side note, I am a great midwife and I can take you to the hospital and you can have a beautiful hospital birth as a hospital transport and everything will go smooth. I am a terrible doula. I am so proud of those doulas out there that go to these hospital births and they are sweet and smiley and they help women and support women on their terms. I love that. Thank you, doulas. I'm gonna raise my palms to you. I'm not that woman. I am not the woman to hire when you're like, I think I'll have a natural birth. Let's just see how it goes. No, I'm the one that's like, no, let's help you have a natural birth. And so um, anyways, I went to probably three, four, five, births as a doula pretty close together in this little trial to see if this would be the right fit for me. And this happened in all the births. Okay, they had epidurals, they pushed with intent just like I described, their physician did the vigorous perineal massage and they were in position, some positions were better than others. And um, well, one of them had a C-section. So, but, but other than that, the um, they had you know tears. They had vaginal perineal tears. And I, you have to remember, I'm coming from this home birth perspective, right? I've only seen other than those little births. I've only seen home births, right? And so, first of all, our women push naturally, unmedicated, in an optimal position with the baby in a good position, and there were some tears. And I did see some suturing, but nothing to the degree that these women were experiencing. Also, all the home birthers, they just know that you're going to get in the herb bath. We did all our prenatal care talking about getting in an herb bath. And right after they gave birth, they got in an herb bath. And then they had enough herb baths for the next five days, right? And so they were prepared for that. It wasn't weird. The hospital birthers, on the other hand, have never heard of anything like this. This was a new concept to them. And their doctors are saying, don't get in the bath. So first of all, they have far worse traumatized perineums than the home birthers. And they don't have the comfort level to take these herb baths because their doctor told them no, because they don't understand the value. So these women had weeks and weeks and weeks of stitches and burning and bruising and pain and discomfort and swelling and just all the like all the stuff that's conjuring up in your mind of the uncomfortableness and the the pain associated with that their situation was longer that their healing process was much longer than the home birth people because of those reasons. Does that make sense? Okay. So I became really acutely aware of just how valuable the prevention of tears are and how valuable the treatment and the natural remedies that help restore and heal and help your body recover from birth. They are not real, from my perspective, they're not optional, they're not a luxury. They're like foundational part of healthcare. Your postpartum experience is going to just continue to be an extension of what your birth experience was like. It's gonna be a reflection of your support 
It's going to be a reflection of your nutritional and your physical health, and it's going to be a reflection of your psychological and emotional preparedness for the reality of the intensity of birth and the reality of what is required during postpartum. Okay? And as a midwife, I know, especially a woman that's never given birth before, there's no way she can have all of these perspectives accurately. And so she's not going to know how to prepare herself. That's why, that's why midwives and doulas and herbalists, that's why we're all here to help her not have to suffer longer than she has to. Okay, postpartum herb baths. Postpartum herb baths are blended with herbs that are specific for preventing infection, minimizing bleeding, reducing the swelling, reducing the pain. And when I say preventing infection, I'm, I'm saying preventing like just bacterial infection on the wound side itself, but also infections like UTIs and bladder infections. And they're really good at like those wet, oozy, and they're really good at drying out, not dry, like dry and brittle, but just not, not excessive moisture. They help with drying out all this excessive stuff. So when you feel so wet and goopy all the time, and so it helps rebalance your, your vaginal ecology, right? Postpartum herb baths, I call them victory baths. So you just went through this whole immense process of being pregnant, going into labor, pushing your baby out, and now you're recovering, right? And you celebrate, be proud of yourself. You get a, you're victorious. You're on the other side, right? So this is your victory bath, right? And just in the home birth setting, we put women, once they're able to stand up and go to the bathroom and not feel dizzy or lightheaded, so like, maybe two hours, maybe three hours after birth, we're putting them in the herb bath right away, them and the baby. If you have a hospital birth, you're gonna to have to obviously get home, but ideally, wouldn't this be great? If you got home and somebody was already prepared for you to come home and that your bed was already made, you already had some food, some soup, the herb bath was on the stove, you get to come home, you get to like rest for a second and then just get straight into the bath with your baby and then you get to go lay down and rest. That would be really ideal, right? And then the, the beauty of the bath is just like, you know, when you just are in so much pain and you've had a long day and you're tired and that, that, that feeling when you sink down into hot water and you get all those pleasure bumps, right? That in and of itself is really healing. But then also you bring your baby into the bath and you have your baby in there. And it's so beautiful because as long as there's not a lot of bright lights on them, Right, but so you can either turn off the light or have natural lighting or maybe some candles and you put them in the water. It's so, it is so, so sweet. So they're all like bundled up at first, right? They're all bundled up. They've got, they've got light on them now. They have gravity on them now. They've got like fabric on them now. They were in this really dark, quiet, wet womb space where it was really quiet and all the same it felt good in there and now everything's loud and shocking and, and so they're like right and then you put them in the herb bath and they they unfold and you just see them just relax and they like look around they open their eyes sometimes they open their eyes the more that the most you've ever seen and they look around and then they start displaying like they're ready to nurse and it is so sweet and then they can like sometimes it's a good position for you to sometimes it's awkward you know but sometimes it's a good little position for you to to get that baby in the herb bath and then get you try to practice to learn how to nurse and just to keep yourself warm and the baby warm make sure you have a like a washcloth in there and you can keep that washcloth warm and wet and lay it on top of the baby and just take your time. It is beautiful being in the bath. And you deserve to bond with your baby and bond with yourself. It is so, you've done so much. And this baby, it's just wonderful. So it's my favorite part. 
is their bath. I love it. That's why it's called the victory bath. And um, when you're in the bath, you're going to want to stay about 30 minutes, but you really don't want to stay longer. So 20 to 30 minutes is probably enough because your first 10, 15 minutes, your body is just absorbing uh, the water. Your body's rehydrating, right? And then after your body's rehydrated, then it can absorb all the therapeutic properties of the herbs. And then after about 30 minutes, you start to dehydrate. The, the water starts to leave your body, so you don't want to do that. So after about 30 minutes, you should get out. If you're gonna make your herb bath yourself, you can just choose a whole bunch of herbs and on the blog that's attached, there are some list of herbs to use. If you're gonna use our herb baths, I have them all set up for you. So if you're gonna use our herb baths, it's gonna come in a bag that looks like this, and this, this is sealed closed, and they're inside the bag, it's gonna have the herbs in it which are calendula, plantain, yarrow, shepherd's purse, and uber ursi, and sea salt. There'll be a bag. All the contents of the herb bath fit nicely into the bag. And you just tie it. I, I didn't want to just open one up just for you to see. I know you can imagine. This is full now of everything that was inside here. Inside here also has instructions on one side. It is for a full bath to like fill your bathtub. And on the other side, it's to make a sitz bath, which is just a little soak for your bottom. I'll tell you more about a sitz bath. All the instructions are on this card, so I'm going to just briefly tell you. You get your biggest pot boiling. You have it boiling. You turn off the heat. You put your herb bundle in. Put the lid on it. Let it steep for about 30 minutes. Make sure the bathtub is clean. You are not doing cleaning your bathtub. Somebody else is cleaning your bathtub for you. Let's be clear on that. You, here's another thing. You can clean. My preference is that you use an eco soap. You don't need a bunch of Lysol and harsh, harsh chemicals in the herb bath because it's you're so delicate right now and so is your baby. So being mindful of that. The herb bath is, once it steeps for about 15, 20 minutes, then it's gonna be ready to go. Once you pour, if you're gonna do the full herb bath, you're gonna pour it into the bathtub. You just fill the bathtub up to the temperature you want. Then you pour your herbs in, and then you'll have this herb bundle, right? Go ahead and massage this herb bundle, massage this herb bundle, and it'll release more of the therapeutic properties of the herbs. The water will get darker. You can use this herb bundle when you have tender places like your breasts are sore, your nipples are sore. You know, you can use this as an herbal compress in those areas also. And one bag makes one full bath. Ideally, whether you have stitches or not, you will have at least five herb baths during your first nine days right? Because you need it. It's so important for you. What I'm trying to say is we have a, a package because I want you to have the five herb baths because I, from my personal experience, that's what it takes. You have one herb bath, that's great. Two herb baths, that's great. But once you have five herb baths, then you're like, oh, I see the noticeable difference. I feel significantly better, right? It's, you kind of need to have repetition of the application of the herbs. So at least five herb baths. So when you get five herb baths on our shop, you also get a free cord care powder to go with it as a way to be like, see, good for you, getting what you're supposed to get. If you're gonna make sitz baths, I understand not everybody has a bathtub, not everybody can do that. And so they're gonna do sitz baths. So you can buy one of these things at Wal, this, I got this at Walgreens, and this, it goes in your toilet. So you lift up your seat, you lift up both seats, everything's super clean, you set this in the toilet and it tells you the sides in the front, the sides in the back. And then you make your herb bath and you pour the herb bath into this basin. And then you just, because it's just application of the direct application of where the tear is. Yet, you have to remember, which is perfect, but you have to remember your whole body, your skin is your largest organ and it absorbs. 
everything and your perineum is not the only place sore you have your back sore you have um, your whole body sore um, heaven is giving me a cue okay okay so if you're gonna do a sitz baths you still need to do at least five of them and one bag will probably give you three three sitz baths so if you're gonna just do sitz baths you might only need two or three bags depending on how how many you're gonna take okay what else oh there's another thing and I wish I had it here for you and I was I looked through all my supplies and I didn't have it and this is a perfect example of a person not being prepared when they need something here is another midwife trick that will help your perineum and I need you to listen because it's you're gonna say what I don't know about that I don't know and this is what I want you to listen to it's a seaweed it's called kombu k-o-m-b-u it's in the blog post so you need to use your imagination. I'm holding up a rigid sheet of very dark green seaweed. It's like about this big. You get it at the Asian store or at the health food stores, right? It's rigid. You're gonna need to tear it or you're gonna need scissors to cut it out the size that you're gonna need. The size is gonna just depend on the size of your tear. Okay, so you cut this piece out. This is the piece. Seaweed, kombu size. This is a good size. Might be, might make it a little bit more narrow. Now, this is rigid. You're like, what? What do I do with this thing? What I want you to do is get a small basin of water, bowl of water, and soak your seaweed in there for like about 20-30 minutes. The perfect time to do this is when you're preparing your herb bath, and then you prepared your herb bath. You prepped your peri bottle. You've got your seaweed soaking. You take your herb bath. You're getting out of the herb bath and you're about to start to get dressed and start to put your pad on. Before you put your pad on, you get your seaweed. Listen, this is important. I need you to hear me. Don't just take the seaweed out and stick it on you. No, take the seaweed out, run it under cool water. Like rinse it a few times. Really make sure you get it all rinsed off so you get all the salt off. It will no longer be rigid like this. It'll be slick and slippery and soft. It'll feel really smooth and silky and soft and wonderful. Once you've rinsed it a few times and it's soft and silky, then it's ready to lay onto your tear. You can lay it directly on your tear. It is wonderful. It really helps pull both sides of your perineum together in a way and it just holds it together really nicely. Uh, we, uh, there are a couple of midwives here in Fayetteville we're like, oh yeah, we're kombu converts. Like seriously, you can see the difference between a person that utilizes the kombu and the one that doesn't utilize the kombu. I just have had people not really rinse it very well and then they get mad at me because they put it on and it stings. The reason it stings is because there's still salt on it. So you have to rinse the salt off for it to not sting and it'll be really slippery and feel great, okay? All right, I feel like there's a lot more to talk about. The next piece is, is the pad sickles. Okay, the pad sickles. Once again, you're gonna need to utilize your imagination. So pad sickles are herbal versions of these ice packs. A beautiful thing about pad sickles, that's pad, peri cold pack ice sickles, are because they're cool. And the, one of the primary sensations women have when they have tears is they have a hot, heavy perineum. It feels hot and heavy and swollen and just hanging, right? And the ice helps relieve the inflammation and it helps relieve a lot of the pain from the swelling and inflammation. A perfect time to apply the pad sickle is the scenario that I just described. You get out of your herb bath, you're in the hot herb bath, and then you put the cool, cold pad sickle on. You have alternating from hot to cold. That is one of the most wonderful attributes of hydrotherapy 
What that does is that improves circulation to your perineum and to the tear. And when you have improved circulation to the tear, you have fresh blood flow. And when you have fresh blood flow, you have new, um, a healthier immune system. And it's going to help granulate and close the tear and granulate and create new cells quicker. So alternating from hot to cold is going to improve the circulation and shorten your time. Okay, so to make these pad sickles, come back to your imagination with me. You have your herb bath. You have your pads. I'll just go ahead and open this pad. On the blog that you will read, that's linked below, has all the photographs of me doing this at somebody's house, at their birth, after they push their baby out. So you take your pad, be real mindful to not touch the, the part that you're going to place on your tear. You have washed your hands, your space is clean. You're being really mindful of hygiene. Okay, and now you simply, very simply, take some of the herb bath and pour the herb bath onto your pads. Pour the You don't want them to be overly saturated because if they're overly saturated, they're not going to be able to absorb any blood. And when they thaw out, they'll be wet, super wet. So you want to saturate them just enough. It's not a, an exact science, but there is a little bit of an art to it. You want to not saturate them too much. If they seem, if inside the bag is really wet, it's too much. You're going to need to like not use so much. Okay, once you have these saturated with herb bath, you go ahead and place this into the freezer. And then, when you're ready, overnight. And then when you're ready, you take one out, you let it thaw for about five minutes so it's not icy freezing cold, and then you place it on. Right? And so now you have an herbally infused with antiseptic first aid herbs that are going to help with your hemorrhoids, going to help with the hot, heavy feeling, going to help reduce your swelling, help prevent infection. And it's going to help rapidly precipitate your, the healing process. All right, and you made them yourself, and so that feels really cool and empowering. Okay, what else do you need to know if you've had a tear? What else is important to know? A couple of important things are the thought of pushing out one more thing is like it's kind of anxiety provoking actually for some people who are like I, I don't know if I can push anything out it's like stressful fortunately before you went through birth before you gave birth and maybe even while you were giving birth you had cleansing bowel movements that was one of the signs you were going to go into labor you had all these cleansing bowel movements and then you probably had a bowel movement or two before the baby was born as you pushed and so then you're pretty cleaned out so fortunately you're not going to have to have a bowel movement right away and most of us are in labor for a really long time and as much as we midwives are trying to get you to eat we know you're not going to eat that much and so you probably don't have that much anyway a great thing to do is to have fiber fibrous foods right flax brownies flax muffins are great and a smoothie i used to make the smoothie i recommend women to make the smoothie with banana and flax and dates and raisins and even a little molasses all that really helps soften everything so you can have a cleansing bowel movement and you don't have to push if you're in a situation where you feel like I feel really constipated and I need to push, please take an herbal stool softener from the health food store and do not take a laxative. A laxative is too strong for you right now and is not recommended. So an herbal stool softener. Once again, that points back to hydration, needing to get enough hydration. The other thing, I made a video last week, and I probably should have talked about it while I was talking about the herb baths. Another option, if you don't have a bathtub and you want the therapeutic properties of the herbs and you want that healing moment, you know, to be in 
be with yourself, to process your birth experience. The herb bath really creates this like really beautiful environment for you to go through it and a psychological and emotional and a spiritual healing, not just a physical healing, right? If you're not able to pull that off in a bathtub, you can refer to my yoni steam video on how to do it, and you can do a yoni steam instead. And that'll be a nice way to heat up your body, have the herbs, the steam directly up, touching, applying to your wound, and it offers a really safe and sacred place for you to process all the emotions and all the sensations that are coming up with you because I really feel like from my own personal body I felt this way and I see a lot of women and they feel this way it's like the processing of the birth just kind of keeps unfolding and there's all these like nuggets and insights that just keep coming to you as the days go by and at first they appear really clear like you have moments of clarity and aha and insight and then it'll quickly fade so creating the yoni steams or the herb baths are great ways to create space for those moments of clarity and then i encourage you if you have moments of clarity like that go ahead and write your birth story right then or write down that piece right then because you'll be surprised you think you'll remember it forever and it'll fade away it fades away on purpose because you're going to want another baby again maybe right might not really want them <laughs> might not really do it the other thing that's really going to help you in terms of perineal care and postpartum recovery is having a good lube so you can get a more sexy lube this just comes in your birth box but your vaginal area is it may be wet from blood but by the time you're ready for sex, everybody's a little bit different, right? So I'm just going to give you the standard status quo textbook answer, right? The textbook answer is once you stop bleeding and you're six weeks postpartum, women, some women, you know, their libido, they want to have sex much sooner. And then, you know, that's kind of just on your own discretion. But as a midwife, I feel like saying, wait till your bleeding is stopped. And then once you wait till your bleeding is stopped, you're gonna be feeling really dry and because you are making breast milk now and you're not uh, moist like you were when you were pregnant and so you're gonna need some lube. I have a whole blog post about sex and breastfeeding and you might wanna check that out if you're wanting to explore what sensuality and sexuality is like after birth. A few things I do wanna say is um, there are a few more things I need to say though. There are healing stages about your perineum, okay? At first, like I said, it's gonna feel heavy and bruised and swollen, and then it'll start to feel tight, and then it'll start to have a, an itch to it. There'll be a, it'll itch. That itch is a healing itch, so don't be too concerned about that itch. And then the incision side or the, the tear side will be red for a long time. And then eventually it'll be pink. And then eventually it'll be the same color as the rest of your labia and the rest of your perineum, the rest of your body. The other thing is to remember that this is a process. This is a healing process and it takes a long time. It takes several weeks and there are some days where you feel really great and there are some days that you don't feel so great. There are some days that all you can do is just rest and nurse and just take care of your body and take care of your baby and you can't do anything else. And that's not being lazy, that's being appropriate. That's being doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. The more you spend resting and taking care of yourself in the beginning, the much quicker you will recover in the long run versus the women that feel like they have a good day and they wanna quickly get to the gym or they wanna go shopping or they wanna go somewhere. They're, they are just prolonging their recovery because soon they're gonna have a bad day and it just keeps prolonging and prolonging and prolonging. So please get, have your five herb baths, get your support, have your teas, have your everything you need, your, your peri cold packs and your peri bottle. 
your kombu. For all the kombu, you're going to get several sheets in your package. If you don't utilize all of it on your perineum, that's fine. Eat it postpartum and make beautiful tofu seaweed soup. It's going to be wonderful for your postpartum recovery. There are a lot more I want to say about this whole topic. What I'm going to do is once this live is over, I'm going to make a video that's just about the DIY pads and I'm going to make a video that's just about the herb bath. So if you want just that information, it'll be quicker and easier for you to access. And I want you to remember the links below because there's lots of resources for you down there. And hopefully this was helpful for you because this is a real important thing that gets overlooked and women feel alone as they're crying in their bathroom. And I know there are people of you doing that right now. And so I'm here for you and I appreciate you and know that you're doing all the right things. Okay? So until next time, my friends, drink deep and always walk in beauty.